Welcome to Diffuse Congruence. This is the American Muslim Experience. My name is Zaki Hassan, and I'm here with my partner, Professor Ahmed. Hey, listeners, welcome back. And Zaki, good to have you back as well. And, uh, good to have me back. I haven't been gone. I know, that's right. But, you know, it's always a pleasure to be well, face-to-face. Well, thank you. I, I almost believe that. Yeah, the, <laughs> He's a good actor. <laughs> and acting is not even my... Uh, you can't I, see his face, yeah. listeners. He's, he's using air quotes. <laughs> it's good to have you back. <laughs> but uh, no, no, and, and especially today because I'm I'm in one of those sort of fanboy meets. This is uh, so cool. Yeah, this is so cool. This kind of moments, uh, uh, you know, bucket list kind of guests on the show. And so, yeah. uh, without further ado, we are joined by. Uh, we're here with Brother Ali, That's who has, over the past nearly two decades, earned a wide critical acclaim for his deeply personal, socially conscious, and inspiring brand of hip-hop, unleashing a series of lauded projects and establishing himself as one of the most respected, independent voices in music. His albums include Rites of Passage, Shadows on the Sun, and most recently, All the Beauty in This Whole Life. Brother Ali, thank you so much. We are... We are <laughs> blown away that you're Man, sitting here I'm with a, us. I mean, we were just talking before we turned the mic, uh, the, the <laughs> mic on, but I'm a big fan of the podcast. Wow. I, yeah, I li- listen to every single one. So many of my friends are on here and heroes and... It's really, it's really dope. I really appreciate it. Oh man, it is such an honor. And 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 and, and again, not just to have you on the show, but to be seat, you know seated in one room and just face to face. So we can't thank you enough. Um, so a, as a listener, you know where we're going to start. And and I often kind of uh, this <laughs> the, the introductory question I like to ask is about the origin story, mm-hmm. where it all began. So uh, if you could take us there, that would be that would be beautiful. Kind of walk us through that journey. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So I was born in. Um, I was born in 77, Okay. which is a, a city of Salma loves to point out the year that is 77. That is. You know what <laughs> I mean? right. In the Muslim community. Yeah. You and know? no, Zucky, not just the year that Star Wars came out. I was about to say. <laughs> no, yeah, yeah. Which is also, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. <laughs> but, <laughs> no, no, yeah. But yeah, so, you know, 77 was the year that Sheikh Hamza and Abdul Hakim Murad and Cat Stevens and a number of other people in our community all became Muslim hmm. um, and there are others and Sidi Osama can run rattle off the list but then also that's the year that he and I and Sheikh Yahya wrote us and you know there's a bunch of people that were born there born in 77 yeah. that's, right. Huh. that's right wow yeah. so I was in Madison Wisconsin and um, I didn't live there very long I ended up moving around a lot in Michigan um, and my parents were Midwesterners and um so I think that really the most important thing about my childhood is me having albinism, being an albino. Hmm. So I have basically you don't have the pigment and melanin that would give color to your skin, hair, and eyes. And, um, you know, also legally blind, extremely sensitive to light, not good depth perception. So, you know, there's just a lot of, like, difficulties, but the most significant of which is being in these little towns and moving a lot. So I was always the new kid. Yeah. And walking into a school, not being able to see and looking really different. Um, there was just a, a variety of experiences about, you know, why does he look like that? Mm-hmm. And there's one in particular that I think really highlights what that experience was like was I walked into uh, the school on the se- first day of second or third grade, and some kid was like, why does he look like that? And somebody said, he has AIDS. And just announced it with, like, all the authority of, like, the president. You know what I mean? Right. It was like, that's, this, that's yeah, what it is. The definitive sort of diagnosis, prognosis. Yeah. Uh-huh. It's like early fake news. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> yeah, but it became the truth. So, and, and my name at that school was AIDS. Like, people didn't know my name. Like, everybody called me AIDS. And um, there was even a the, the the point where I realized how difficult or how like hurtful and nasty that was, was that there was a teacher who wasn't my teacher and I was lost in the hallway because I get lost a lot and I trip over things and like, you know, right. so she saw me in the hallway and she was like, hey, and she was trying to help me. She's like, hey, um, and she couldn't remember my name. And she was like, hey, uh, <gasps> and I just saw the look on her face, like oh. the horror that she was like. You could tell she had told herself never to call me that. Mm. And that's when I realized, like, oh, that might be a really mean thing to say to me. That might be really, like, they might be really mean for calling me that. Mm. But in the 80s, we didn't know what AIDS was, that's you right. know. Um, and so there was, like, this whole, like, like myth about yeah, how right. I got it. My, um, and somebody, on the school ground, it was kind of like the ultimate cooties or whatever, right? Oh, I mean, yeah. Because kids man. would throw that stuff around. I remember that. Yeah. And so somebody decided yeah. that the way that I got it was that my mom and dad were brother and sister. And that somebody else added that 
you know, all of this stuff. It became like, a whole mythology. Yeah, man. It was like, you know, I was like, a, yeah, by the end of the kids, year, I was huh? like part werewolf and like, all, you know. Um, wow, but so my mom had the idea to, I have a song that I wrote about this called Pray For Me. But my mom mm-hmm. had the idea, we, we switched schools over the summer. And my mom said, okay, we're going to dye your hair. So nobody, you can basically pass as like a regular white guy and nobody will know that you're albino. So we're going to dye your hair and we're going to get you tinted glasses and you'll start at the new school. And so we went through this whole process of trying to dye my hair and um, finally got it. But then I showed up at school and I didn't quite, it it never looks right when you try to do something like that. Mm -hmm. And it really added to, I'd sunk into this really deep depression that was worse than being teased or harassed or marginalized or bullied or whatever you want to call it of my mom basically told me that you should try to look more like the people that are dehumanizing you Mm. you should actually try to appease them that they're right that's right like what she didn't realize that though of course because she's a motherly love yeah i mean she's a pretty white lady and she's never dealt with that before Mm. but she did in her own way because she actually is an eastern european origin we found out much later okay through dna tests but she was adopted by a Norwegian family in Wisconsin. So they're all blonde. So she dyed her hair blonde to fit in with her family. So it was like, no big deal. You dye your hair, you're blonde, just like everybody else. That's what you do to fit in. So she thought that would be good. But then there was an African-American woman who worked at my school who saw what I was going through, saw the depression, understood it, and used music to help get me out of that. So she showed me Elvis Presley. And she's like, yeah, he's really cool. Uh, he sings, he, you know, he can sing black music as almost as good as black people can. <laughs> and she said, and if you don't know the difference, you would think that he's the best. Mm. If you don't know any better. But she said, look at his hair. So he had that pompadour hairstyle. Right. And she said he invented that because he was trying to be part of the blues community. He didn't want to steal the blues. He wanted to be part of it. So he's trying to look like Muddy Waters. Oh, wow. So, you know, so if you look at Muddy Waters and look at Elvis, you yeah. see that's what he, that was his version of trying to figure that out. Mm. But then she said, why does Muddy Waters' hair look like that? That's not natural black hair. He had a process because he was this big, dark skin, you know, must like big, imposing black man trying to be safe in a white world. Mm-hmm. So he, you know, did his hair, whipped his hair up and, and made it look like that. Mm-hmm. So she said, what are we going to do about this? So she's telling me about music because she knows I love music, yeah. but talking to me about hair. And she never says, I know you're an albino. I know that the, I know that your presentation isn't your real presentation, right. um, and African people have more albinos per capita than any other group of people, mm-hmm. and it's more it's it's more apparent and obvious. Of course. So African people all over the world know all about albinos. It's not weird to them. Right. Um, and it's everywhere I go in the world, like if there are African people there, they yeah. almost they'll almost come and check. Like, are you okay? Yeah. I was walking one time in uh, Australia with two brothers who actually were West African. Okay. One's named Tunji, one's named Ashanti. Mm-hmm. And we're walking in this like open market kind of thing. And we see this like West African man and he walks over to me, the, out of the three of us. And he says, Salaam alaikum. I was like, why alaikum salam? And he's like, are you okay? And I was like, yeah. And he was like, do you need anything? He was like, do you have to put, well, you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. And that's this whole thing. I'm not wearing a kufi. Yeah. I'm not, there's no beads up anywhere that you can see. <laughs> you know what I mean? I think my beads were under my shirt. Mm-hmm. And uh, so Tunji and Ashanti are like, why the hell did he talk to you? Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, why <laughs> yeah. did he say, he didn't say anything to us. Right. And they're like, how do you know you were Muslim? That's right. And I'm like, man, that happens every, all over the world. Huh. Yeah. So this lady, then she showed me James Brown. Okay. Say it loud, I'm black and I'm proud. And she's like, look, he cut his hair, he grew his hair naturally. Mm -hmm. You have to accept yourself in order, if you're ever going to be anybody, you can't expect, you can't try to make other people accept you until you accept yourself. Mm -hmm. All this kind of stuff. And so that really was like my opening Mm -hmm. into into the way that like, oh, so my mom doesn't know how to help me with that as a white lady Mm -hmm. because she hasn't had that specific challenge. Mm -hmm. She's had other challenges. Everybody's got their, their their difficulties in life, but she can't help me with that. Her life hasn't prepared her for the for that. Right. Uh, but this woman, and so then after that, all of my friends. This is I was like seven, yeah, eight years about, old. Just about to ask how yeah. old you were. So everybody in my life after that point was black until underground hip hop, and then a bunch of white people. <laughs> you know what I right. mean? Because that's who listens to underground hip hop. Like independent. How rap. about on your dad's side? Like, where's your dad from? And 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 and, and that kind of background yeah so they thought they were German 
Okay. Yeah, they thought they were German. We, that's what we were always told. Mm. Um, but you know, I did a DNA test that basically sounds like that looks like they were actually um, English. Okay. Yeah, but they're white. I mean, yeah, yeah. they're like white Midwesterners. And then my family also was had a lot of like people say dysfunction, but I mean, our family moved a lot, and our you know sometimes my dad would move before us. And, okay. You know, so our family would be separated a lot. And you have siblings? He, yeah, I have a younger brother. Okay. He was dealing. My dad uh, st- struggled with addiction his whole life, and then the men in my family have all died of suicide. So, like my dad, my grandfather, and other people in our family that were like secret. Mm-hmm. But now that I kind of start putting some pieces together, yeah. I realize that's a common thing. My mom also died young too. So I was a lot of times like much of the time was actually in the homes of black families that raised me and taught me. And then at 15, I became Muslim. So I be I yeah. Fell in love with hip hop because I felt like so all my friends from the time I was a little kid were black in the eighties, and this is like you know little towns in the Midwest that are ninety five percent white, white yeah. small little black communities in each place. But um, so I know my friends are amazing, but nobody knows it. White people don't know that. Mm-hmm. Like my friends are like the way that they, the way they say things is really incredible. The way they do things, the way they approach things, the way they love is really unique. Mm-hmm. The way that like even like boys and men show love to each other is really special. Right. You know what I mean? Right. As you know, like I'm saying, like I know how much you love Dr. Jackson and other yeah. other people. Right. That like there's something about the way that like black men love you. Huh. That's different. So it's true. you know, I think it's better, but that's my personal bias. But it's clearly wow. it's got its own yeah. texture. It's different. It's, so yeah. True. It's so true. I never kind of ident like even called attention to it or identified it, but mm-hmm. you're absolutely right. Because when the I idea, think of my relationship with like Imam Siraj yeah. or you know, Dr. Jackson being two in particular that I can think of, Imam Zaid to a lesser extent, but who have had who I, who are it's, it's a relationship beyond the teacher student more like someone i really have gotten close to Mm -hmm. on a personal level there is something very unique about that relationship Mm -hmm. and and another thing that we've covered we've covered on the podcast and what and i've gone back and i've listened to a lot of our older shows and i've kind of been able to kind of glean this connective tissue between say someone like even Essan bagby and Mm -hmm. others that we've talked to who talk about the the reluctance or the uh, the agitation that they felt when they or that they experienced when they came, became Muslim mm-hmm. was often more often than not from their paternal, like whoever that mm. the black male figure was in their life, mm-hmm. if it was a father or someone else. Yeah. It was from the reluctance, you say? The reluctance of like, why are you going to, like, why are you becoming Muslim? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Like even Osama can, Osama's right? We, we talk about Osama. Right. Where his like, mom, his mom's, mom's white. riding. Like, That's right. Yeah. His mom's white. His, his father, even Mustafa, I think, talked about this. Um, the father's black, yet the reticence and the reluctance and the, mm-hmm. and the agitation that it caused within yeah. the family unit mm-hmm. was more from the, the black father. The, yeah, the, well, that's a protective thing. Right, it is. Yeah, right, that's a protective right, thing because right. it's like you're already a black man. I was about to say, right, I, you know I can I mean? see. And now you're adding on to that an identity that's understood mm. to be exceptionally militant and anti-establishment and things like that. Mm. Yeah. Um, you know, Imam Muhammad changed a lot of that. Allah have mercy on him. Yeah, but, mercy on him. Um, you know, that, that's, that's something where a lot of dads were just like, you're, right. this is going to be really difficult now. Mm. You're adding another, you're otherizing yourself by another Even further. Layer. Right. 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 I never thought, okay. Right. As, like the idea of you've been born into being a black man. Mm-hmm. That's something yeah. you can't do anything about. Right. And you have to bear the quote unquote burden of that. Yeah. Now you're going to choose this additional thing on top of that mm-hmm. like it's like why i get that as a yeah. from a the perspective of a protective parent like why mm-hmm. don't you do this to yourself there's another layer though depending on how you know rocky and turbulent your teen years are mm-hmm. where it's like this thing actually could really ground you mm-hmm. there's the, so it kind of depends on where you're at okay in in your journey from just, and this is just me witnessing and this is, these are my observations of mm-hmm. course and and I'm not qualified to talk about this beyond the level of observation, but right. the you know what I've seen is when when somebody is really in in trouble. If you're mm. already in trouble, mm-hmm. then the idea of becoming a Muslim is like okay, maybe this will this will be your 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 path to 
a more st- some stability mm. and this discipline that yeah. this is going to bring into your life will be a good thing right yeah so it kind of depends on where you are and then also your parents relationship with it mm. yeah. but and and their perception of islam i would imagine i mean you know the black the, people appreciate Islam in, in yeah. a different way yeah, yeah then the yeah. well yeah and, and because it was it was i think telling that you said that uh, you know, you're, you're otherizing yourself further by adding this sort of element of being seen as a further yeah. militant. So it's it's you not know, it so much like it's not like so much like um, from my you know observation that black parents are like I don't like it. Right. I don't like Islam. Right. And there is some of that, oh, right. but that would be where it, only in instances where people are like really deeply rooted and connected to Christianity. Christianity, right? right. In a um, way where that feels like an affront to my religion, but that's rare. From what I've seen, that's mm-hmm. very rare. See, that's how it's, I interpreted it. Yeah, but, it's, but, it's, I mean, it's not it's like so I don't like it for you to say that. It's, it's it's more about this is you know it's it's the it's the 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 social perception of Islam. Yeah, mm-hmm. you know what I'm saying. Mm-hmm. So if you so you know as like families where it's like we've raised you to be socially acceptable, you know what I'm saying. We've 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 raised you to be upwardly mobile and mm-hmm. things like that, mm-hmm. and to to care about trying to give you all the tools to right. to to fit in it. And, and, you know, and now you're coming to adding this thing, right. like the like, like the deck's already stacked against you. Why are you gonna yeah. exacerbate it? Exa- exacerbate it further, hmm. yeah. right? But so that that really kind of unique, um, the unique texture mm-hmm. of black love and things like that. I yeah. really felt like you, you. with hip hop, I finally heard like a because none of the TV shows when I saw black people on TV, like that's not what my friends are like at all. <laughs> You know what I mean? The little representation that there yeah. was, even, and and then you know, then later the Cosby Show right. came and things like that, First and thing. it was like that was good, but it also didn't wasn't representative of my experience in the Midwest. Right? There, there are clearly are families like that on the East Coast and in major like like chocolate centers, but for my experience was was a lot more like good times. Yeah. Sure. So good times to me was like, oh, this yeah. kind of reminds me of the black families I know, right. but white people didn't watch it. Um, so yeah. <laughs> for me, I was like, okay, hip, there's so much genius in hip hop yeah, and there's so much subtle nuanced, like genius and like layers and levels. And like, this is amazing mm-hmm. that when hip hop came out, I was like, finally, the world is going to recognize like the, the genius, the of, genius black. of young black yeah. men in particular. Yeah. Right. And, um, so that's why I fell in love with hip hop. Mm. Um, and so it actually, you know, through through the years, it caused a lot of tension with me and my parents. So, who were some of those early um, artists that you know within the hip hop community that really spoke to you and that really, like well, the, you said, the you, early ones were when I was little, and it's yeah. before hip hop kind of made. There's a there's like this big transformation that happened in the late '80s, as you guys know. So early on, it was like Houdini and UTFO and Run DMC and Slick Rick, and you know, to me, my favorite at that time was uh, Grandmaster Melly Mel. Yeah. Because he was such a poet. A child is born with no state of mind, blind to the ways of mankind. God is smiling on you, but he's frowning too, because only God knows what you'll go through. You'll grow in the ghetto, living second rate. Your eyes will sing a song of deep hate. The places you stay and where play and where you stay look like one great big alleyway. You'll admire all the number book takers, drunk pick pushers, and the big money makers. This whole thing. And then he, he follows somebody's life all the way to them being to committing suicide in prison. Hmm. Huh. You know what I mean? It right. was plain to see that your life was lost. You were cold and your body swung back and forth. Now your eyes sing the sad, sad song of how you lived so fast and died so young. Like, come yeah. on, man. Right. It's like, and he's in his 20s from the wow. Bronx. Right. You know what I mean? In that school system. And he's this big, muscular, like, could throw you through a wall guy. Yeah. With this big booming voice, and like mm. he's wearing like leather chains, and like they just looks like, you know what I mean? And to me, I was like, that's it, like that's that's all the complex nuance of black genius. Yeah. But it's also and poetic, but it's also written from a place of love mm. and empathy. And like I've seen this happen so many times. Mm. Yeah. And like he sat down with a pen and a piece of paper and wrote that, and uh, and and like. America has to deal with that now. Like, that's what I thought. Yeah, yeah. You know, so then in the late 80s, everything takes a huge leap, and you got Rakim. Right, Rakim. And then, and then you also the production side, too. So that's when they really, that's when sampling technology comes in, and now you can, you can mm-hmm. sample and layer samples. Mm-hmm. So before that, the sampling technology wasn't that great. So in the, in the block parties, and, and this is, you know, 
the in Harlem in the Bronx, and my wife is from my my wife is from the Bronx, so I, I have an oral tradition and connection to this. Hip hop or Islam, traditional Islam, really helped me understand and contextualize hip hop a lot better. Wow! Because of the fact that my teachers are the tabi'in of of hip hop, so you have the you have the <laughs> you know you have the Sahaba generation, yeah, that's right. That's right. <clears throat> which is you know you have uh, Cool Herc, which would be. The, the the equivalent of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, mm-hmm. and then you have um, Africa Bambada, which I would say is like one of the four Imams, the people that codify the tradition, and then you have the Tabi'in. Yeah. So the Tabi'in are Chuck D, Rakim, yeah. KRS One. Yeah. These are the kids that are little kids watching this happen, the second generation, right. and those are my teachers. Mm. So I'm a Tabi Tabi'in of hip hop, right. and I have Isnat, and then also my wife. You know, being connected to my wife Tiffany, right. um, you know, she also connects me to the Black and Puerto Rican experience in the Bronx. Right. So the aunties and uncles, you know, I have oral like history mm-hmm. of 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 you know them telling me as the the Sahaba and the like the Ansar of that community and like oh yeah I remember when that happened and like you know so I ask them like the blackout of seventy seven like what you know what happened and what what are your memories and you know Mm -hmm. and so they'll tell me like oh yeah i remember you know after that so and so started having parties and then i go back and read about it and yeah during the blackout of 77 uh people that couldn't afford dj equipment broke into all of the the electric electronic stores Mm -hmm. and stole equipment and so then suddenly there's all these new hip hop groups because of the blackout of seventy seven. You know what I'm saying? Huh. Yeah. So like that was the big one in the eastern e- eastern seaboard. Mm, uh, yeah, I don't. Yeah. I can, I'm I'm not yeah. sure how far it right, reached, right. but I know yeah. that it was a big deal. Mm-hmm. And um, you know, and you can look and see footage on YouTube of like people that went out and recorded. So as as a as someone who isn't as infused or entrenched within the hip hop culture uh, or certainly the history of it. I know geography also plays a role, meaning Mm -hmm. there's certainly there's an East Coast and there's a West Coast kind of tradition. Mm -hmm. Continuing with your metaphor of of, of, of yeah, so so the West Coast is Hanafi. Okay, you know, (laughs) I was going to say, is it like an Ajami Arabi thing, or is it okay? Yeah, like you've got Arab. The the, the difference though is that um, it's I wouldn't say that that's quite the Ajami, but it but it is. like Arab and non-Arab. Mm-hmm. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, it's, but but it is, um, you know, a difference in location. So you have like, you know, Medini. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Maliki. You've got the Medini school. The, the Medini school, the Maliki as school, it were. which is based on the Amal of the people of the South so, Bronx and Harlem. Right. You know, and then you know, then you have these other traditions that come right. up. I would say the West Coast and the Hanafi school. You're kind of you're you're, you're bereft of that because you're not there at the focal point. Right? right, Basra and and Baghdad. These places become important later in Muslim history. Right, and they're but they're ma- they're mastering the text. And they're learning that way. It's not and they're learning, they're, yeah, and 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 they're mastering, you know, the hadith tradition, right. and, and like their understanding and their ability to like codify hadith and things like that become really strong exactly. because they're leaning on it. Right. So on the on the West Coast, um, you have people who learned about hip hop through like really knowing these records. Mm. Like they get the records, the hip hop records, which is the which is like hearing a hadith. So when we talk about West Coast, though, where are those centers? Um, is I mean, Oakland? Oh yeah, Oakland's yeah. Certainly Oakland, a place. I mean, yeah. No, Oakland uh, is big, and um, man, Ellen. Sacramento is big. Really? Yeah, okay. man. A lot of the stuff that we understand. So the the dance crit styles. Uh-huh. You know, a lot of times we think about break dancing. Yeah. But really, you know, the the style of dance. So in hip hop, the four cultural or like artistic elements are DJing, which which really has a, a, its root in Jamaica and in the Caribbean. Okay. So the that style of like the musical style of hip hop mm-hmm. really comes from there. Yeah, yeah. So you have um you know that style of of playing dub reggae music. Mm-hmm. So it's like the instrumental versions of reggae records and then a DJ talking over that the dub. Yeah. And so Cool Herc is is from that tradition and he comes uh to the Bronx where there's not a lot of Jamaicans. Okay. And so he starts doing that style of DJing. Mm-hmm. Um 
where because they don't have a dub version of a reggae song, but they have a funk records. And so he actually is the one that says the break in the middle of a funk record or a disco record mm -hmm. uh, is similar to a dub. And so if you get two copies of the record okay. and you just play that section over and over again, yeah. you know, that's called extended break. That's the break of the re the song. Extended break DJing, which is what he brings in. Mm. And... Um, you know, so he actually starts by just playing those records, yeah. but then um, uh, uh, um, the other DJs like Grandmaster Flash yeah. and like Allah uh, say Muhammad, Africa Bambada, they start actually, you know, they're the ones that really master that. And Grandmaster Flash actually adds uh, some new technology to the mixer, the, like the DJ mixer, yeah. so that you can play one record out of the speaker and listen to the other record and cue it properly mm. so that you can start it without losing the beat. And then the people start dancing to that and that's where they, that's where they get break dancing, like they dance over the break of the record. Oh, wow. So great. Okay. Yeah. So never so, have known that. Yeah. yeah. So we're getting etymology, genealogy. We're getting it all here. Yeah, this is man. amazing. Thank you. So and so wow. uh, you know. And so the, but you were saying the elements. Sorry. I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm yeah. So emceeing. Emceeing is one. DJing. Mm -hmm. Graffiti art and breaking the dance. Okay. So so on the East Coast you have like that style of dance that we think of what they call top rocking, which is basically the the kind of jerky back and forth style of, of moving and posturing and posing. Mm -hmm. And those poses come out of the five percent. The five percenter, uh, you know, of the course. five percenter had certain ways of standing, the, yeah. you know, they, 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 that, that would like indicate to people that I'm a f member of the five percent nation of gods and earths. Mm -hmm. Which comes out of the, as you know, you guys have talked about a little about that, about that on the show. Yeah. But we could go into that if you want to. But so that's basically, Whoa. you know, comes out of Mosque Number no. Seven in Harlem. Yeah, I, I mean, to talk about Islam's connection to the hip hop uh, or, or the roots of the hip hop culture, I, I, w I want to almost save that. For, I, I mean, I well, definitely want to get into that. Yeah. But I feel like we're on to something here. That yeah, yeah, yeah. Track of that. So, so basically, you have dancers that come up yeah. in the East Coast, but then there's a whole other style that comes from the West Coast that we talk about as popping and locking, which is like, that's the one where, like, obviously the listeners can't see, but that's the one where you see people m starting to move the body and then lock. So, you know what I'm saying? So it's like you have, like... Um, the 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 kind of like body rolls where like the the body is like your body will roll and then stop and then you'll you'll quickly change positions and then lock and hit mm -hmm. on that mm -hmm. that comes out of the west coast mm -hmm. yeah and then a whole also um you know other styles of of making beats come out of the west coast mm -hmm. uh you know production styles and things like that mm -hmm. and then once you get into sampling then you really have like two methods of sampling you know what I mean? Because the on the East Coast, like it all comes from down south, but then James Brown moves to the James Brown lives on the East Coast, mm -hmm. and so they sample heavily on they draw heavily from James Brown. Okay, so he's kind of like the imam of their like sampling. You know what I mean? Uh, but then, or like you know, in their it's not a, of sampling their chain, and but then on the West Coast is George Clinton and Parliament. And everything associated with them. Very different. You know what I mean? Yeah. So you have like, you know, the the Dr. Dre kind of like meth have of sampling right. that, that borrows really heavily on George, George Clinton. Clinton. Okay. But and then on on the on the East Coast, you have I would say probably um, Marley Moore is probably the, the leader of like East Coast sampling. Okay. So he's the guy that produces Rakim, he's mm. the guy that produces Big Daddy Kane, okay. he's the kind of like school out of which a lot of that stuff comes. Okay. And then the people that learn from him become the bomb squad and public enemy and they become like other parts of that right. that, that thing. Because so 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 hip hop is borrowing from the musical traditions already available and already in vogue within yes. the black community. Well, yes, and that's so the you've thing. got the funk, yes. you've got um, reggae, reggae, rock, jazz, I mean, rock, or like, rock, like blues, guess, yeah, blues, yeah, because uh, all American music is black music, right? R and B, I mean, even R and B later on, maybe, yeah, right. So it basically is. I like that all music is, is black. Music. It is. Yeah, it, I'm saying like yeah. even country, even everything. It's all black music. It all it all originates with black music. So then you have new genres that 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 emerge of white people playing black music yes. and white styles. Right, which right. that's if you look at like country, that's basically white people playing the blues and and doing their own version of it. Appropriating. To a degree, but they yeah. but the fact that they were able to bring enough of their authentic stories to it mm. really shows that they were um, 
that they they were creative in that in that oh, genre. Oh yeah, I see. I don't use appropriation at least in this context as as a pejorative, mm. uh, or, or that they're just mimicking. Um, my idea here is is that you borrow, but you also infuse with your own personal. Right. I mean, to yeah. Me, that's so if, what if you look at like a like a Bob Dylan, yeah. Or if you look at like so, Bob Dylan is is playing the blues. Yeah. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. But then he brings so much of himself. He's so authentic. That's right. You know what I mean? That like that's his own style of right. music. Right. So then you get you know a singer songwriter folk. It creates a genre of music, and then Joan Baez and all these yeah. other people come along in mm-hmm. that genre. Mm-hmm. He created a genre because of of what he brought to it. Yeah. And you know similarly with somebody like Johnny Cash or someone yeah, like that, think or, of Johnny Cash, yeah. or mm-hmm. even um, um, uh, you know. Hank Williams and others that really uh, brought Guthrie, so much. Uh, yeah. yeah, Woody Guthrie. Woody Guthrie, right, yeah. right. That's who I thought of. But yeah, yeah. so many of these mm-hmm. these people that right. you know, they they clearly took a lot from the blues sensitivities right. and they took the the blues structure. Right. Uh, but then they brought so much to it that it created their own thing. Whereas, like when I think of the, the word appropriation, it just really depends on its usage. But yeah, yeah, right. when I think of appropriation, I think of <clears throat> somebody like a Justin Timberlake, who like. Michael hmm. Jackson is not a genre of music for you to just do for the rest of you know what I mean <laughs> and he's fine he's great he's yeah, fine yeah, you know whatever yeah but uh, uh That's, yeah. you know what I mean yeah yeah like yeah. basically like you're just making Michael Jackson records 30 years later and you're white and you're handsome you're a handsome white person making Michael Jackson music <laughs> right and so we're just all gonna pretend that we don't realize that you know what I mean uh that's so yeah, so 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 the continuity, like you're saying, because of sampling, yeah. it allows for continuity intergenerationally, mm. um, which also talks about like when we talk about traditional Islam or wh- whatever that means to different things to different people, but the idea that like it's always incorporated with the human touch that I learned from people who sat with people who sat with people who sat with people mm. means that you don't just learn it from text the text right. so it's not like so so okay so somebody like um you know like like a lot of maybe um artists that don't come from that culture yeah of, of the black culture right they learn it from listening to the record which is very very different from sitting in a living room or from being at barbecues every you know or being at the family reunion and you know playing it saturday morning so when you live in black houses uh especially certain like church going black folks uh, you know, every Saturday morning they play music and you clean the house. Everybody cleans the house. Like that's a that's a that's something that happens in the black right. community. That's a thing, right? Yeah, right. you yeah. play loud music and everybody cleans the house. No. And they clean the house like nobody cleans the house. Like they wash the walls. They, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Like things that yeah. like that that like in, in my white household right. we never washed a wall. I never heard of washing walls. No. You know what I'm saying? No. Black people wash their walls. <laughs> Church going like that yeah. specific. Then there are other folks that like live different kinds of ways. You right. know what I'm saying? Okay. But like the the folks that that go to church and are looking to be middle class and iron their yeah. clothes and tuck in their shirt mm-hmm. and all that kind of stuff. They wa- it's like a certain type of cleaning. So right. And uh, they also taught me uh, hygiene, a different level of hygiene, man. You know what I'm saying? That like you don't just get a bar of soap. And, and wipe your body like you need a washcloth and you wipe the soap on the washcloth huh. you don't wipe the bar of soap on your body because everyone else is going to use that same bar of soap it's gross that's the you know what I'm saying that's wow. the standard that's the wisdom so like yeah. wipe it on a washcloth clean yourself with the washcloth everybody has their and own the wash rag yeah. uh, you know what I'm saying everybody's got their wash rag they're hung in the thing and you know what I'm saying and then every week you wash your wash rag and like and there's a certain uh, you know you wash your face first and then you wash the other thing and you wash your behind your private parts last. last. So you don't have to re- reuse those. Yeah, 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 yeah. You I know see. what I mean? Because if you have you a face... The utility of that. Yeah, oh, yeah, you have a face rag. <laughs> but then when you think about... Like, these are people who come from Islam. You know what I'm saying? So, like, in wudu and ghusl and mm-hmm. things like that, why do you wash your hands first? Because mm-hmm. now you're going to wash your whole body with your hands. With your hands. <laughs> and, and, and the hands by themselves, that initial washing, in none of the schools, that's not wajib in any of the schools. That's true. But it, but it's it's the the like mustahab is the yeah. mandu way to do it that you wash your hands first so that when you wash your the the, the thing that you're washing yourself with is clean. Yeah. So when you think about like the connections between all these things, right. um, fascinating. But so the the human touch and the continuity is in hip hop because of the fact that most pe- the hip hop producers like this these are your black parents and grandparents and uncles and aunties this is their record collection that you're pulling from yeah. So the fact that you're sampling, 
you know, Stevie Wonder and James yeah. Brown and, uh, you know, the Gap Band and like mm -hmm. all of these, this, you know, these are mom and dad's records yeah. that you're repurposing mm -hmm. for, to, for your own thing. And you're putting them, you're putting a new t spin on them, but they're alive. It's a literally a living tradition that every generation has continuity. So even the new music that they call like trap music is all based on the 808 drum machine that that came in in the 80s. Mm. And like, so like when you go to a black family reunion or, or barbecue mm -hmm. or something like that, like literally there is like there are 70 year olds there, there's 50 year olds there, there's 30 year olds there, there's 15 year olds there and there's kids there. And the mute like you literally can go between genres of music and nothing is that out of nothing's out of place. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? So if you if you if you play you know, a Tribe Called Quest song, everybody knows what to do with that song. Mm -hmm. Like, everybody gets it. Yeah. And then you play a Lil Uzi Vert song, mm -hmm. you know what I'm saying, or you play a Cash Money Millionaires or something. Mm -hmm. Everybody knows what to do with that music. The 70-year-olds know how to, how to move to that music and get it. It's like, oh, okay, you know what I mean? Yeah. And you can see, you know, a, a black grandma listen to the music of, a, of, of the kids. Yeah. But still and it, not a and certain certain yeah. ones comes on and she's like, I like that That's one. Right, yeah. And also the slang and all of that stuff is like there's there's continuity in it. Right. And so you really see the difference between, you know, so then when somebody who's not from that culture comes in yeah. and starts, you know, make producing art within that culture, you can feel the difference. Right. Huh. Where it's like you're not. Some people are connected. So Eminem, for example, there's a real connection there. Right. And all of the hip hop artists will say he's one of the greatest of all time. Mm. And he has no problem giving credit where it's due. Oh, yeah. Because also he's another one that everybody knows what he brought to it. Mm -hmm. The people that are masters of it, you know, so Eminem, they gave him a Grammy. He knows it's white people's white America's first time hearing multisyllable intricate rhyming. Right. So the first Grammy he got, he read a list of all of the artists in the hip hop tradition that did that before him. Wow. People that yeah. um, white America doesn't know. Cool G rap. So all these people. Mm -hmm. uh, but because you can go listen to Cool G rap and then you listen to Eminem and you're like, oh, he learned this. Mm -hmm. But he added that. Mm -hmm. And what Eminem added is part of the ecosystem now <laughs> that everybody else draws from now. Right. So like you hear younger black artists that 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 Eminem's just part of it. Yeah. Because Eminem comes from Detroit, Eminem was in those households. Eminem was like, he didn't just hear rap music in a suburb somewhere, yeah. and be like, oh, I can do that, right? Like he has the human touch. So Eminem, I, I would consider the Ajamis like the white people or the people from other cultures, uh, also the Filipino brothers and sisters, also the, you know, people from down south, etc., that like come into the culture, right. and are uh, like really able to contribute. Eminem's contribution is as an edge of me. Okay. But 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 he he you know, he was able to look at things from an analytical perspective yeah. that that, you know, as an insider just it's just in the water, you wouldn't look at it like that. Uh -huh. So he's maybe like a who who uh 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 I'm almost say my man. Who's the who's the Siboe? Yeah. That that codified Arabic. The Arabic language. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Who has a lisp. Right. And he's not an Arab. He's not an Arab. And but but he's like, here's the genius and and so he shows it in a way right. where now everybody can even the Arabs can benefit it from it that's in right. a certain way. That's right. Because he really comes in and appreciates that's what Eminem is. Uh. Eminem is the Siboe of, of hip hop. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? You're only gonna hear that here. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Yeah. Um who else though? Like it's like Cypress Hill, maybe. I mean, is that or is that my getting too mainstream? No, 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 no. Uh, yeah, so Cypress Hill is really important. Okay. Well, well, in terms of like, um, yeah, uh, you know, uh, in terms of Ajami, I guess, or Beastie oh, Boys. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. No, Beastie Boys would be a great yeah, example yeah, of that. Beastie Boys. Yeah, yeah. yeah, and and Beastie Boys, you know, brought a lot. Right. You know, they brought a lot of their own thing. You know, Run DMC wrote the early Beastie Boys records, so like the, they basically were like, we're going to be the Jewish Run DMC. <laughs> You know what I'm saying? Right. And, you know, when MC wrote their joints. Right. And it's interesting because, um, you know, they were... they. So if you look at, like, back in, the, in in those times, there were people that didn't like what the Beastie Boys were doing. Mm -hmm. They kind of saw them as, like, the Khawarij of the of that. Because yeah. they came in and they were wild and reckless. Yeah. And they were doing things that, like, black artists never could get away with. 
You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. And uh, so if you look at like, there's early footage of LL being on tour with them, LL Cool J, yeah. being like, these guys are not good for this culture. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Whereas Public Enemy, for example, which is like the most pro-black rap group ever, is like, no, they're necessary. Right. This is amazing. Right. Public Enemy starts out opening for the Beastie Boys. That's the way they got their start. Right. You know what I mean? Right. And, um, That's it. you know, so so basically, so, so Public Enemy says, we need to be able to compete with any musical genre. Right. So if we open up for Anthrax, mm-hmm. we need music that's powerful enough to compete with Anthrax. They get on stage with a band and all their amps and everything. We're going to make music that can compete with that. You know what I'm saying? Right, right. Yeah. First time I ever saw Public Enemy, and you're gonna laugh. Um, they opened for U2 of all bands. <laughs> this is I'm talking about the year, early '90s, mm-hmm. '91, '92, circa '92. Yeah, because I was in high school, and they opened for U2 of all bands. But 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 that's because I know I, countless interviews where Bono was like, Chuck D is the voice of the masses. Like Chuck D is a voice that you have to hear. Yeah, you know. So the those become will be televised. You know. Yeah, so, yeah. those become my uh-huh. my mashayich of him. Mm. So all the people that I grew up idolizing, mm-hmm. it was the you know kind of my holy trinity was Chuck D, KRS One, and Rakim. So when I was 13, I went and saw KRS One give a lecture at Michigan State University. Asked a question at the question and answer. He brought me on stage. Wow. I have a photo of it. Um, and I'm 13, and he says you should read the autobiography of Malcolm X. Okay. And that's what that's what led me to Islam. I was gonna yeah, we wanted to go back to that. As yeah. Well. And so then then Rakim brought me so on wait, tour that's for a year. That's KRS One. KRS One. Yeah. And then. Um, Chuck D really becomes my 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 proper sheikh. Now, but for those who may not know, like what it, what do you think? What is their direct or indirect affiliation with Islam, if any? Yeah, no, it's 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 yeah. really great. So it's really big. So Rakim is one of the the leaders and voices of the five percent nation of gods and earths, which okay. is um, you know in in the nation of Islam in mosque number seven, where Malcolm was the yeah. teacher, obviously. Um, to join that mosque, you had to uh, adhere to a really rigorous and serious discipline code and lifestyle code. Yeah. So you couldn't just be a regular guy and become a member of the mosque and hear Malcolm every day okay. and hear the teaching. Like you had to wear a suit, you had to be clean and sober, you had to have a job, you had to, you couldn't hit women, you had to like, you had to like really right. have it down as mm-hmm. in Harlem in the 60s and 50s. In right. the late sixties or late fifties, early sixties, right. like it was really and so challenging. The five percenters. So basically, there was a guy specific, right. like named Clarence Thirteen X. That's right. Who um, there's differences about his story. Some people say that he he wasn't able to maintain the disciplinary code, mm-hmm. and so they actually put him out of the Nation of Islam. His followers say that he left because he didn't like the exclusivity of the Nation of Islam. Mm-hmm. But it, either way, mm-hmm. he really drew on the fact that that those lessons. Uh, of the Nation of Islam, which are conversations between Elijah Muhammad and his Shaykh, mm-hmm. uh, you know, Farad Muhammad. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So they, they rhyme, actually. Who is the original man? The, the Asiatic black man, the maker, the owner, the cream of the planet Earth, father of civilization, God of the universe. They rhyme. Mm-hmm. So he, made, he took advantage of that. I don't know if that's intentional or not, mm-hmm. but, but he started, you know, teaching them in rhyming form. So all of the, to kids, and you could still smoke weed, you could still play dice, you could still be in the street, but you'll learn about the fact, about your original nature, mm-hmm. the fitra, basically, mm-hmm. and what it means to be a khalifa. Mm-hmm. So when they say, and me and Rakim have had these conversations where, you know, when they say the black man is God, theologically and ontologically, that's a problem for a traditional Muslim. Right. Uh, you know, in like Ashari or, or Maturidi or like, you know, Hanafi or whatever. Like, that's not going to work for us. traditional schools, right. No, it's like that. So ontologically, no. But in a Ibn Arabi sense, if you're saying, if when you talk to them, well, they still believe in the Most High. And like, we are the reflections of the Most High. Right. We are the living breath of God. So in an Ibn Arabi sense, that whole like really unique kind of nuanced conversation around who la who like it were it, he not he mm-hmm. that that this is the theophany you know what i'm yeah, saying yeah. if you look at it that way right. it's fine yeah you know but that's not that's not you know any in yeah. any way um Agreed. so he brings that to the masses and they basically say one of the things elijah muhammad taught was that um 85 percent of the world are deaf dumb and blind these are huh. the poor masses 10 percent are the rich blood suckers of the poor 
this is what we now call the one percent mm -hmm. but ten percent are the, the the people who know the truth these are the masons mm -hmm. these are the freemasons etc what they now would talk about as the illuminati Correct. like these are the people that draw on the wisdom traditions right. of of their original ancient peoples yeah and they know the truth and the global monoculture is a trick they're playing on the 85 percent and then you got five percent which are the poor righteous teachers the the wise muslims and muslim sons so you know th this is their language yeah. so the five percent are the people who know who the true and living god is okay. you know what i'm saying that's right. this is their language yeah, yeah, yeah. so um rakim is the greatest mouth like like vocalizer and like spokesperson for that within hip-hop got it uh, so PR, our, PRT comes from that. Poor righteous teachers, poor righteous yep. teachers yep. themselves yep. come from that. Oh yeah, five percenters. Oh yeah, yeah. Poor righteous teachers. The five yeah. percent are yeah, the poor. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Just, I mean, I knew and, that. And wasn't then, you know, if you look at accidental. like Brand Nubian, right. like like their main song, "Wake Up," that whole thing. You know what I mean? Uh, uh, the attribute of Haji helper to it. H A G I, helper to another God in need. He Allah God Islam. I proceed to civilize the uncivilized. I guess I'm like the, uh, this Asiatic black man is a dog spelled backwards, the maker, mm -hmm. the owner, the cream of the planet Earth, father of civilization, God of the universe. And then, you know, they also had all these other things, but like that song in particular. Yeah, it's like almost a... Yeah, yeah. it's hifth of, of, <laughs> of the 5% of the, of of, the, of, of the lesson. Of the aqidah, the same way, of the 5%. Yeah, lesson. it's like Ibn Asher. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. And, and, and for the Malikis. That's like, right. Like you, 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 you memorize, or, 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 you know, one of the other ones. Like you memorize these didactic poems. That's right. And that's what hip-hop is for the 5%. You know what I'm saying? Right. You you memorize didactic poems, and then when you come around them, your sheikh, which they call the enlightener, mm -hmm. um, will ask you, and you have to memorize it. And you start like that, like the Quran school, like with the tablet. Yeah, you know what I mean? Right, when you write the right. you you memorize that, and they ask you. You know, they ask you to. They ask you those questions, that's and you right. give them the answers. And it's through that, yeah, yeah. Well, memorization. So that's right. where the idea of the cipher comes from. The the hip hop cipher of people okay. standing around, and the cipher is is which is a circle is you know zephyr in Arabic the the zero. Oh, okay. So the idea of like we stand in a circle, a, a zephyr or a cipher, uh, yeah. and ah, um, cipher and, and, you know, it and it's also a hadra. You know what I'm saying? In a circle, and and we build on the the the, the, the we're breaking down the hakika, the the like the ultimate reality. reality. That's yeah. what all that joint is, man. And so like the the. And now the is way, it true with the Allah, like the arm, leg, leg, arm, head? Is yeah. that also part of the, or is that the five percent? Yeah, yeah, that's yeah. part of. Five so that so that was at, that was a uh, that was like a bid on on behalf of. Uh, of Clarence Thirteen X, okay, that he basically added certain things. Got it. Where he hmm. would, you know, where where yeah, he added certain things. So some of the things that he and his team added were that, and the, but then also they would look at the alphabet, and so they would say A is Allah, B is B B E, C is S E E C, you know, D is for and 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 they had one for every, and then also numbers. So one represents knowledge. Two represents wisdom. Three represents understanding. Four represents culture, refine mm -hmm. culture and refinement. Okay, you know, and and on, so and so. So they would say like, you know, so for today, like right. for example, that we're doing this on what's the day today? The first. First. So let's do another one because we got a best. So they say, what's today is mathematics. So let's say today is the twelfth. One is knowledge. Twelve. One is knowledge. Two is wisdom. Hmm. Knowledge plus wisdom equals three, which is understanding. So, what's today's mathematics? Today's mathematics is knowledge, understand, knowledge, wisdom, all being born to understanding. Okay. One plus two equals three. So they would take <laughs> these three different concepts okay. and say one is knowledge, two is wisdom. When you add, when you bring knowledge together with wisdom, you get born into understanding. And they had one of those for every day of the month. Hmm. And so every day you had to know what the date was, and you had to know the different concepts, and you had to have a way of what they would call borning the lessons, which means that, like, how do we bring these into being, hmm. these concepts? You had to know how these concepts work with each other. So it's really amazing, man. And so, so the way that these guys kind of relate to it is that, you know, uh, Rakim is a member of the Nation of Gods and Earth, Chuck D., uh, had a relationship with the Nation of Islam. They became honorary members with Minister Farrakhan's Nation of Islam. Um, K 
KRS One on another on, on, on another side says, "I'm not a Muslim, but I do support them." My the Creator in heaven taught me and taught them. Hmm. I'm not a Christian, but I won't diss them. I'm not a Jew. I don't practice Judaism. And then he talks about metaphysics. So his whole thing is like metaphor. And he actually KRS actually started his own religion called the Temple of Hip Hop. Okay, oh, which was really contentious yeah. in yeah. the hip hop world. You know, um, so there was this. You know, but but basically all of the great hip hop people had a relationship to Islam, and really hip hop, whether direct or tangential. But yeah, yeah, yeah. Some of them became Muslim. So Ice Cube, for example, is the father of um, intelligent West Coast gangster rap. Sure. So he did all the writing for N.W.A. Right. And then as soon as he left N.W.A., he basically became like what they would say the fifth Beatle. He became like another me- an extension of Public Enemy. Okay. So after he leaves N.W.A., he's the one that wrote After Police and stuff. But then N.W.A. went super like shock rap. Right. Where they're like killing yeah. prostitutes. After, after he like, left. Yeah. Yeah. yeah N words for life and like that whole thing. Mm. So Ice Cube leaves them for business reasons, he says. But mm-hmm. then he comes and joins Public Enemy. Basically, yeah. and he does his next record, his solo albums, his first ones are with the Bomb Squad, Public Enemies, and now he becomes, you know, Khaled Muhammad is on his records, and then he actually said his shahada with Imam Jamil El Amin in Atlanta. Ice Cube did back really? in the day, yeah. So he was a he was so he's a Muslim with shahada. A tribe called Quest. So then you get like the Tabi Tabi'in yeah, of hip hop. Right, right. There, a lot of them are shahada Muslims. Right. Tribe called Quest. Um, you know, uh, th- two of the three. Yeah. So Ali Shahi Muhammad is Muslim. Uh, Q-tip, Q-tip is Kamal and becomes right. Muslim. I'm not quite sure about. And it's interesting because the one Christian in the group, his name was Malik. You know what I'm saying? Was his birth his name. Wife dog. His birth name. Yeah, his name. His wife dog. Right. Yeah. Right. So like, Malik. yeah. Come on, man. <laughs> you know what I mean? Um, but then also, uh, you know, others like the, you know, so Wu Tang. Started out as five percent, as most of them have taken their shahada now. Um, you know, so so many of the people from mm. in hip hop are either related in some kind of way. But the understanding of hip hop is that you have those four cultural artistic elements, and then the fifth element of hip hop is knowledge of self. Mm. And most of that knowledge of self comes from Islam or Black Islam, as Dr. Jackson would call it, or mm. proto Islamic movements and yeah. those languages. Right. All of the so then you had Africa Bambata, who who is you could say is the one that codifies hip hop as a culture. Yeah, he's the one that named it hip hop. That said, graffiti, break dancing, um, uh, graffiti art, and MCing and DJing are all part of the same culture. Called it hip hop. Started the Zulu Nation. Yeah, which is basically him taking all the street gangs in the Bronx and saying we're all going to come under because he he watched Shaka Zulu, the movie Shaka Zulu yeah. about South Africa, where you got colonizing forces coming in. So like we all have different tribes, so we'll all become part of this thing where like you know we'll we'll take on this kind of group identity. And he actually, Africa Bambada, convinced the the street organizations and gangs in the South Bronx and Harlem to use these artistic art forms to settle their differences. So they stopped fighting each other and shooting each other and things like that. And they started using emceeing, DJing, parties, breakdancing, and graffiti right. to settle their disputes. And if you look at the literature of the Universal Zulu Nation, most of it is from the Nation of Islam. Okay. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, could could you talk about the the uh, the etymology of like hip hop as a like you said the term? Well, where did where does that come from? Well, it's kind of it's 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 not really sure. KRS One has his you know, theory has right. his theory, but it seems like an after the fact thing. Gotcha. You know, so he says you know it it means uh, intelligent movement. So to be so he said KRS says, and there might be something to it. He says you know to be hip is to be in the know. Right. And and um. You know, to be current and to be present. It's presence. You might even call it mindfulness. You know what I mean? Yeah. And hop is to to move. To move, to do something. Yeah. To act. So it could also be seen as what we were talking about yesterday, what Sidi Osama was teaching us about, so what, now what. Right. So hip is so what. Yeah. To get it. To be to get the joke, right? You know, as Azhar Usman says, you know what I mean. Right. They, they get the joke, and then hop is like, what? Do, now what? Mm-hmm. What do we do with this? Mm-hmm. You know. But I, I, yeah. the the guys that were around at that time were like, man, KRS is our our kid, and he made that up. 
He invented okay. that. Okay. You know what I mean? Right, right. Yeah. And then what, what about, well, what's your, like, the hit, like when you go back to like Coltrane and Miles Davis, I mean, there's a connection to Islam there too. Definitely with Coltrane. Yeah. Yeah. Coltrane, Coltrane said a Shahada according to his wife, Alice. Yeah. And like um, even a love supreme, I mean, like Preacher, I, I you know, I was at the Preacher Master show last night. Mm-hmm. Preacher talks about this. I mean, a love supreme is a law supreme. Hmm. Huh. Like even in the name, I mean it's it's possible. That, that's a that's, I mean, I know. that's akin to KRS right. thing, hip hop. Right, right, right. I know, and that he, came later. Yeah, and to <laughs> and to to be fair to preacher, I mean he made that he made it's, that clear. It's a retcon. But, yeah, <laughs> retcon. Mm. Yeah, <laughs> but uh, I I was just fascinated with that in general. I mean because it, regardless of whether a uh, love supreme is a love yeah, supreme and or it's, not, it's, it's the like connection that Coltrane had, I knew his wi- his widow speaks of that. Yeah, and that's true. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Yeah. His widow speaks of that. And you know, and, and his first wife Naima, and and you know Muslim. their daughter, I, like they're all Muslim names and things. He would probably be in today's uh, language would be considered a perennialist. Okay, you know what I mean, uh, where yeah. he believed in yeah. all of the like authentic yeah. wisdom traditions. Mm-hmm. Now the perennialist will say like like uh, you know according to like. Um, Dr. Nasser. Yeah, because it was named, even within the perennialists, you have like sort of different. Yeah, different, yeah, different. Yeah, that had yeah, within yeah. that. That's right. So, like, but but Nasser, most of them will say, like, you have to join one. You don't mix them. You know what I'm saying? Uh, uh, Coltrane seems like he was a person that like embraced yeah. them all right. and was kind of like synthesizing them all in his own heart and yeah, life. Right. But if you, if I really recommend it, you probably already have, but um, Chasing Train is a documentary about him on, right. on Netflix. And it's just like, okay, this is a wali of Allah. Has to be. This is a wali of Allah. Uh, that, you know, he's the roomie of, of modern music. Mm. Yeah. The, and his whole thing is like, you know, Allah saved me from addiction. Allah, you know, brought me, gave me children. Allah gave me, you know, and he's ecstatic. And, and you know, he wrote Love Supreme in a matter of days. And then he went in the in the studio and just laid it down in, a, in like a day. In a day. Yeah. 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 And it's, it's tremendous, man. And now they've released the other takes. So there's yeah. each one of those songs. I think they took each song four times, I, I believe. That. And, um, you know, so you can hear the, the initial ones mm-hmm. and then also hear the alternate takes. Mm-hmm. And you hear why he chose the one that he chose. For You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Like the first song, Acknowledgement, for yeah. example, like... In the it, there, there are three of the takes where he starts low. You hear the gong, yeah. do 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 do, and but then the one that he used, he starts high. high right. Yeah, it's really love tremendous, supreme. man. Love. Right. Um, so wait, okay. So you've given us just an amazing primer of hip hop. Yeah. Just, we didn't really talk about me, which is no, I know, I know. No, better, that's what we got. No, 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 no. It's not better because I, I want to come back to that real quick, and I know we're, time's ticking as well, but. Um, you said you embraced Islam at the age of 15. Mm-hmm. What was it? Because, I mean, at the same time, you're kind of going, you're moving in between these black families um, in your early childhood. Uh, was was the black church and, 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 and Christian, I mean, Christianity was never a part of that I, I, experience? I, I, was, I was fine with church. Okay. But I didn't believe Christianity. Okay. And I always, I've always been a believer in God. Always, 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 always. I remember one time somebody, I was like seven or eight years old on the basketball court. And, and this kid was like, he was like cursing a lot, like cussing and swearing a lot. Like we were just like, oh, that's what he did. Like he cussed a lot. And at one time he's, he was like, you know, he would shock us with like his cursing. And one time he said you know f god or f the lord or something like that and i remember being like every like stopping everybody you don't say that Hmm. don't ever curse god Mm -hmm. you know what i'm saying Mm -hmm. like you don't do that but and i remember also have like being in really difficult situations and knowing that i could talk to god at any point at any time Mm -hmm. like i've always been i've never had any like leanings towards whether or not you know towards towards atheism or as it is but 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 Islam in particular then comes in, in, into on your radar as it were from hip hop from hip hop and the autobiography of Malcolm X. Yeah, so we heard yeah. Malcolm's voice a lot, right, of course, and and we Same. also we also you know Minister Farrakhan too. Mm-hmm. So Minister Farrakhan is is the Pope of rap. I mean, he is of hip hop to this day. He is. So if you see Kendrick Lamar. Like, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Meeting Minister Farrakhan. You just see, you see Eminem and Minister Farrakhan. You see the look on Eminem's face like, oh my God. You know what I'm saying? Like, hmm. Minister Farrakhan's the Pope of rap. Um, Malcolm X is the, 
is the the Christ, the Jesus Christ of hip hop. Like that's he's the he's the prophet of rap. Right. Right. Huh. Period of hip hop. He's the greatest figure. You know, he's the holy fig. He's the holy one of hip hop. Mm. So I always like knew that and loved them. Um, when I read the autobiography and then I decided I was like, I'm Muslim. I just said I'm Muslim, didn't know how to do it. But then, then the movie came out and it was just like, oh my God, you know? And then, um, but you were already Muslim when the movie came out. Well, I decided to be Muslim, but I wasn't, I hadn't said much. The movie is 92, end of 92. Yeah. So So, 77, that's right around that. Yeah. So I actually said my Shahada in a masjid on, um, Valentine's Day of 93. Wow. Yeah, February 93. How many people became Muslim because of Spike Lee's Mac- Malcolm X movie? Mm-hmm. It's you a know? lot. Yeah. The, right? the autobiography and the movie. And the movie. I, I mean, well, the autobiography, I mean, we have it on. We, uh, yeah. That's part, it's yeah. Been but I mean, the Omar, but, uh, yeah, uh, where but I mean, it's, it's, you know it's like how many people, you, it. how many people's becoming Muslim does Spike Lee. Mm-hmm. You know, he, yeah. he plays a big role in yeah, it. Yeah, you know, and I mean, he's not a Muslim. Right, you know? Yeah. And, um, no, you know, and he, what's fascinating, I mean, you know, what I'm hearing a lot, like I was, I was speaking to a group of, uh, like a, a, in, in Talif parlance, newcomers, mm-hmm. um, at another masjid in the Bay, in fact, and during Ramadan and, um, three people, four people out of the group of maybe about 20 talked about, uh, spoke of taking their shahada after 9-11 mm-hmm. and how mm-hmm. 9-11 yeah. was that moment yep. to that, 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 led to this. I, w- I want to know who, yeah well, what about Islam are. and then yep. next thing you know sure that's very common shahada. that's a very common so yeah. I, I, and when I and so I, I heard that about three times and after the third person said that because I had them going around the room kind of sharing their stories after about the fourth time I said you know for a generation before us it was the autobiography of Malcolm X that served as that defining moment or that yeah. defining experience mm. yeah. I said I go I'm it's cu- I, I'm curious or I'm it's going to be fascinating to see this new generation of newcomers right. of how many tie their connection or their shahada stories uh, to 9-11 or, or to this this uh, orange haired devil that calls himself the president yes sir yeah, sure yeah he's yeah. gonna bring a lot of people to Islam I, I think that's very true mm-hmm. yeah you know yeah. what I'm saying because no, no, you think about this how many white people become Muslim because of Malcolm yeah like Islam is a religion that 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 is that that, to... that makes fuel of tension, right? Like like tension, pain, <clears throat> suffering. It makes it, it, it. You know what I'm saying? It really brings the best out of people. That's right. How many how many African Americans become Muslim in prison? That's right. How many people take mm-hmm. their shahada during Ramadan? You know what I'm saying? Yeah. It's Ramadan. Like this is the That's part. Right. Like this is the hardest part of being Muslim outwardly to, to somebody doing else that, that, right. that doesn't understand. That actually is our favorite part. Yeah, that's our favorite time of mm-hmm. year because it's like actually, I suddenly get all this power to be a Muslim for real. Imam Ramadan. Dawood talked about the one he was on the podcast, like how yeah, I mean he took he, he took his shahada just days before Ramadan. Yeah, mm-hmm. me too. I mean, and that was a conscious decision. Yep. <laughs> Yeah, you I took I took shahada a week before Ramadan and started fasting the right. next day. Right. I said my shahada and I said I know Ramadan's coming. I'm gonna start practicing so I can hit this Ramadan thing. Right. And my parents are like, "You're gonna die. What do you mean you're not gonna eat and drink all day? You're gonna die right. for a month. You're gonna die." And I remember thinking to myself, then let me die. <laughs> like, I'm, I'm so like yeah, dramatic yeah, of course, kid. Of course. But how many, so, so a lot of Americans become Muslim after 9-11. That, that whole tension thing. A lot of black people become Muslim in prison. Mm-hmm. The tension thing. Mm-hmm. A lot of white people like, like look at Malcolm and they're like, I want to be that. Yeah. The harshest critique. Nobody critiques white, whiteness right. like Malcolm. That's right. And, yeah. and you got like Dr. Fr- Fr- Omar Farouk Abdullah. That's like, I want to be, you, you know, mm-hmm. it's like, that's what I am. <laughs> that's what, you know what I'm saying? And, and what's in, what's I want to have you do it on uh, and put it on wax, as, as as we say. But I didn't know you did a great impersonation until yesterday. Mm. <laughs> of Dr. Moore. Mm-hmm. Anyway, yeah. I mean, you can't. You can't, we gotta hear it now, right? Well, I, mean, I, mean, I, don't I, put, I don't want to put you on the spot. I don't want to go into that. Said, said with 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 love and affection, there obviously. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. No, I do it around him a lot, and like he'll ask me to do it for people and things like that, but what's really awesome is that uh, one time uh, he had asked me to accompany uh, his beloved wife, our mother, uh, Auntie Samira, home uh-huh. from uh, Spain. Right. So, like, would you fly home? Would you fly to Chicago with her? Yeah. Basically, like, drop her off in Spain, and then you and Tiff go back to Minneapolis. Okay. I was like, yeah, cool. So, 
and I've traveled with Dr. Omar, mashallah. So yeah. we so we get we're we're like getting ready and things like that. We have a time we're supposed to leave for the airport. I'm running a little behind. I make us like 15, 20 minutes late. Mm-hmm. Get to the airport and and um Auntie Samira says, You know you know how Omar is. Every time he goes to the airport, he goes three hours early. He runs from one place to the other. Like he does. He run. He gets to the airport early, runs to the ticket counter, checks the bag, run to security, get to security. Like almost sprint wow. to the gate. Sit there at the gate. You know what I mean? Always early. And I was like, yeah. And she said, um, why don't you imitate that? <laughs> <laughs> Like you want to imitate something, yeah, yeah, don't yeah, yeah. do his voice. Imitate so, it. Like, imitate how he lives. Yeah, yeah, you know. It's fascinating, yeah. and you know, half of the law, Doctor Omar, but um, may Allah preserve him. Um, <laughs> but it, his energy, man. I mean, because I, I know, like my brother uh, who listens, but I know others who, who went on Hajj with him this mm-hmm. last year, and I mean, they speak of his just in indelible energy just the uh, the energy that just does not seem to exhaust i mean while, while people would be just after a long day go back to the hotel just want to crash whatever he'd be out performing more omros man huh. he would just yeah, oh, yeah. all night yeah huh. it's, we, it's a one well, time we flew home together from lebanon it's like one of the greatest memories of my life like mm-hmm. one of the great experience of my life is just mm-hmm. sitting me and my fa- spiritual father it's just on a plane together, sitting right next to each other, and it's 24 hours of travel home. You yeah. know what I'm saying? Right. And uh, he was awake and teaching me and energized the entire time. And he kept, like, I would get dozy. And, you know what I mean? And he, er, and he would say, you're tired. You should, you should rest. And I would, like, close my eyes, and he would start talking again. And I would, like, wake up, and he would be like, the amazing thing about so-and-so. Like, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. And he's just like, he's so excited he is. that like he, you know, they talk about these knowers of God yeah. and, um, you know, people are, anybody that doubts it, like you've just never been around them. Yeah. You've just never been around these people. Cause like, you know, when you see him and you see his, like, um, how tapped in he really is. Yeah. That like, he's with God in every moment and he's seeing God in everything and everyone. And he sees people the way God sees them. Hmm. Huh. They see with the eye of divine perfection, as, as he says it. They don't see with these like worldly eyes that we see each other. Hmm. We see, we look at a person and we see a dude. They see the creation of God. They see the child of Adam. They see the Khalifa. You know what I mean? In every person. Hmm. And they look at you in, in a way that makes you want to be that. Hmm. And makes you know you can be, you know. I have a song where I talk about Usama and I said, the yeah. only reason I believe in me, trying to be what you seem to see. I love wow. that. I love that part. Wow. Yeah. And that's how the Aliyah are. You know, it's like they, you know that they are living truth. Yeah. Like they yeah. are the yeah. truth. They're yeah. the truth. They're Haq. Yeah. Like they are the living embodiment of God's truth. Uh, and so when they see you and they believe in you, it's like, I don't have anything to say about myself because I didn't create myself. Mm-hmm. And I don't have the right to say that I'm not this or I'm mm-hmm. not that or I'm just a whatever. And I'm, I, I, you know, mm-hmm. you can't, I can't say that because I didn't create myself. Mm-hmm. And when these great people like treat you like that, yeah. it's like I have to, I, this, this is, this is my, this is my goal now. Yeah. You know what I mean? They see in Santa Camo, they see the perfected. That's right. That's right. And, and, and for those, you know, I think, what you know, like in within the Sufi tradition, you know, we you know, there's a lot of talk of velk of taste, you know, and and you have to just you have to experience being in the presence of these kind of people mm-hmm. to know the reality of what you speak of. Certain it's not can... you know you I can't I can't produce a text mm-hmm. that's going to give you the dalil the adilla you need to prove you know the fact that Olia walk among us and 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 and, and the and the majesty of these individuals mm-hmm. is you have to experience it. You have to yeah, be in their Yeah, and that's presence. the tricky thing is like, mm-hmm. and that's the thing that, that um, it's, it's like such a, such a balance and dance between um, somethingness and nothingness. You know what I mean? It's Where it's like, sad. you know, because of the fact that uh, I don't know why God chose me mm-hmm. to know these people. Mm-hmm. I don't know why. Hmm. I didn't ask for it. I, you know what I'm saying? It's kind of like 
a, a, a creation is proof of the creator. Right. Because a thing couldn't exist to create itself. Yeah. Yeah. Guidance is proof of the guide. Mm -hmm. and, and you know what I'm saying? My, my existence is not because of me, because I wasn't here to create myself. Mm -hmm. Also, my guidance, my faith. It doesn't. I, if I would have asked for it, I would have had to been guided to ask for it. Mm -hmm. So You know what I'm saying? That's right. So it's like, why? 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 Like, why do I, why do I believe this? Yeah. Why do I, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Yeah. And then you see somebody... This, this, uh, I shouldn't say this, but, um, certain people will talk about yeah. these, these folks. So, so like, you know, f folks with, with our brother Osama, uh, with the diagnosis that he has, yeah. you know, people are like, okay, I'm going to write the thing about Osama. That's going to talk about how dope he is. And they talk about his clothes and how good he smells and all this kind of stuff. And it's like, yeah, that's all true. Mm -hmm. But like, if that's what, that's, that's what they see. Yeah. They're like, he's super handsome, he talks really great, he yeah. smells good, and he yeah. wears cool clothes. Right. Huh. Yes, yeah. all of those things are true. Right. But is that really the, is, the, is that really what it yeah. is? You know right. what I mean? Right. And so then you start thinking, but and like with the Aliyah, like some people will be like, oh, he's really smart mm -hmm. about Dr. Omar mm -hmm. or about, you know, whoever. Yeah. He's really smart. Mm -hmm. uh, one of them... <laughs> <laughs> our brother Wasim, do you guys know the story about Wasim uh, mm -hmm. teaching mm -hmm. Arabic? Mm -hmm. So Wasim is is goes to the retreat before Dr. Omar. Okay. Uh, our Wasim uh, in uh, in in uh, in the UK. Okay. Really beautiful, great organizer, really important person in I, the community. Okay. When he said the UK, I, I didn't know which which Wasim you were referring to, but now I do. In, in the UK, yeah, yeah. yeah, that's right. So Wasim's in the UK. He's in, a barrister, UK. I think. He's an attorney, isn't he? Yes. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Beautiful, yeah. amazing yeah. human. Oh, being. I, yeah. Like just gem That's treasure, right. Right. and he's hilarious. Right. So like he goes he goes to the retreat before Dr. Omar, and he gets there a couple of days early, and so there's there's some Muslims mm -hmm. around, and so they're they're like you know we have this beautiful mosque and we have a couple of days, let's work on our recitation of the Quran. Okay. So he he sees this African man who's around but he's not really participating, so he's got this tight leaf kind of thing like let's include everybody. So he's like brother. Uh, why don't you come sit with us? And he's like, no, I'm okay. And he's like, no, please. Like, we want you to feel welcome. And nobody seems to know him. And it brings him in. Yeah. And he's like, we're going to do the, the recitation of the Quran. He's like, Dude, let's start with Al-Fatiha. Yeah. So the man recites Al-Fatiha for him. And he's like, you know, he's correcting like little like da, the da sound. And that's the different from da. You know what I mean? It's not Darlene, it's <laughs> Darlene. Right. So he's like working on this stuff. with, And for like three days. Right. So then Dr. Omar arrives, everybody rushes, greet Dr. Omar, it's time for Salat. Yeah. So Dr. Omar leads the Salat. Yeah. And then Dr. Omar turns around and, and does his hands in, like in a, in a, like a, pray, a praying dua kind of motion and kind of makes a gesture. So what Wasim is like, is he asking me to do the dua? Yeah. And then suddenly he just hears this long, beautiful uh, Arabic prayer. And it's the African. From somebody who is like, their state is just like, oh my God, everybody's transformed. And he turns around and it's this man that he's been teaching. Right. How funny. And that man it is. turns out he's teaching Sheikh Mohammed at Jilani. Ah. I had a feeling. <laughs> wow. uh, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> wow. The Sheikh of Dr. Omar That's Farouk right. Abdullah, okay. descendant of Sheikh Ab Abdul Qadir Jilani, descendant of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. You know what I'm saying? Uh, the, the Sheikh of, uh, yeah, Sheikh Amin Al Khawadia, the yeah. Sheikh Kamran Bajwa. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Like this is like one of the greatest living human beings that's holding the universe together. Yeah, if you believe it, that's right. If you don't, you don't. You don't have to. Like Dr. Omar says, you don't have to believe that, but I do. So like, you know what I'm saying? Like, cool. If you don't believe it, you don't believe it. That's, that's fine. Right. You that's don't right. have to believe that to be Muslim. Correct. Uh, you know. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah. But like, so so then he then he then he says like, then Dr. Omar goes to introduce him. And uh, he says, this is our brother Wasim. And Sheikh Muhammad said, no, that's okay. I know him. He's my Arabic teacher. He's my Quran teacher. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> so, like, you can see these people and just see them for them. Yeah. For, see them for their, like, what they call their basharia, like, just their human stuff. Right. And their basharia is beautiful. It is. Like, their right. human right. stuff right. is like, right. so, yeah, you're going to see Osama McCann. You're going to see cool dress, Correct. good talk. Correct. Cool, cool, just in, immensely cool right. on every level. Yeah. Uh... So, like, why do some of us believe in this stuff and others don't? Mm. And to me, it's a gift. And, like, I didn't ask for it. Couldn't have asked for it. So, on the one hand, it's like, this is this is either really good news mm -hmm. about who I am. Mm -hmm. Or if I get judged based on what I've actually done with this this life, 
of mine up against the fact that like I showed you Dr. Omar and you and he and he and he treats you and he cares for you. I showed you Sheikh Muhammad, I showed you Sam Kanan, I showed you you can go who, who, whoever you believe the list is. Correct. Hmm. You know what I'm saying? Hmm. For me it's like um you know the the fact that like I I've sat in a room with these people and and others you know what I'm saying? For for the people that have met Habib uh, Omar, you know, and, and all these other people, mm -hmm. and Imam Zaid, mm -hmm. all of them, all of them, with no exception, mm -hmm. they all say Imam Zaid is one of the greatest of them all. Mm -hmm. Like they all say that Imam Zaid station is is you know what I'm saying? I've heard all kind of people that are that are like um, you know that that reputed to be awliya, like saints, knowers of God. Yeah, they all talk about Imam Zaid, and they're like, people don't know because Imam Zaid is so. He talks to everybody at whatever level you're at. People's imam, right? You know what I'm saying? Yeah, right. So for right. me, he's going to talk to me on my little <laughs> level. You know what I mean? Yeah. But when he talks to the great Aliya, he's talking to them on their level. Yeah. So they know Imam Zayn in a way I can never know him. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. That's right. Well, I think as we sort of wind things down, I, and this has been... I don't know if we can wind down. I was about I mean, to what say... What I'm saying is that, like... I, we didn't talk anything about your story, mm -hmm. but I almost want to like tease that as an opportunity yeah. for you to come back. We, we want to make this yeah. a, a, yeah. a way to, you know, now, now you need to come back. We yeah, got to have right. you back. You know? yeah, so, we, so I could give you a very quick Cliff Note version. The Cliff Note version is that <laughs> it I wouldn't said, do justice, I, I, brother. I mean, it okay. wouldn't do justice. But, 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 but no, no, no. I'm saying do it, but more as a tease because you, you, you got to yeah. come back. And, I said my shahada with Imam Murathuddin Muhammad, son in law. Right. And he was and oh, his son-in-law. Uh, okay, yeah, okay, sorry. Uh, Imam Matthew Ramadan, mm -hmm. um, and uh, was was with Imam Muhammad until he passed. A lot of mercy on him. And then the the last time I saw Imam Muhammad in person, like alive in in, in this realm, uh, was that also the day that I met Dr. Omar. Oh wow, Farouk Abdullah. So there was kind of like a passing of huh. the, wow. of the student. You know yeah, what I mean? Yeah, yeah. And um. You know, so uh, the the music thing comes along to, in the midst of all of that, yeah. and was like a young imam in Imam Muhammad's community was like a youth imam. Okay, and then you know music kind of took off, and then the imam passes away. Then I come out here to go to Zaytuna uh, for to do their summer Arabic to see if they'll accept me as a student, and um, fall deeply in love with Usama. Like me and Usama become friends isn't the word. You know what I mean? Yeah. And um, he says, "So, what does Zaytuna mean for your for music?" Mm -hmm. And I'm like, "I don't. I, I really want to get this. I really want to get learn the religion." Mm -hmm. So he was like, "If you try to do that, mm -hmm. if you try to leave music to learn the religion, he said, I'll block you. Nobody oh, wow. will teach you. Huh. I, I will completely jam you up at every pass." He was like, "I will tell the people at Seekers Hub all your email addresses, and you won't. They won't let you take a course, an online course, wow. on Seekers Hub." Oh yeah. But he said, but if you keep making music, um, then I'll, 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 I will try to convince these people to teach you directly. So the last like five years has been, uh, but I said, yeah, but I need you to be the, the person that, like the, the, the kind of point person. I need you to keep me disciplined with it because I'm an artist. I'm, I'm not inherently disciplined in that way. Mm -hmm. So, and that's what I loved about Zaytuna. It's like, man, yeah. Zaytuna is, like, it's serious. Correct. Like, they're going to keep you on track. Correct. You know. And that's what I wanted, and that's what I knew right. I needed. Right. So, Osama said, okay. Regimented, tried and true kind of methodology of... Yeah. yeah right, so, Osama right. says, um, you know, and Dr. Omar says, you know, Dr. Omar is my spiritual, you know, teacher, master, guide, sheikh. But he says, Usama is part of it. Usama is your teacher. He's your brother. He's your homie. He's your friend. Mm -hmm. Um, but he's also your teacher and there are certain things that I'm, he's like, I'm kind of like leaving us, you in Osama's care for, for that part of things. So, you know, so for the last, like, I don't know how many years, four or five years, something like that, we would never go longer than a few weeks without spending a lot of time together, catch, you know, yeah. like staying on top of that stuff, right. traveling and being together and doing programs together. Right. And then he also has been teaching me and my wife, Tiffany, um, how to do Tatlif style community That's right. stuff. That's right. But also, you know, he says, oh, you know, keep keep everything from Imam Muhammad, that, that that community. Keep all the stuff from the Nation of Islam. Keep all your artistry. Bring all that into it. 
And so um, that's been the and focus what, for the last I couple mean, of years. Yeah, I mean, that's what makes Osama like such a unique and singular individual in that regard because he yeah. brings all of that together. I mean, like, unlike anybody I've ever encountered in my entire life. So. Yeah, man. There's not a praise that you can give a human being inside or outside of this tradition that he doesn't qualify for. I wholeheartedly agree. So uh, thank you so much. Um, you know, and this, as I said, this is. I mean, in all in all honesty, like I feel like all of this was like the prologue. Yeah. <laughs> yes. That, I mean, because because you you blew my mind several times during. I've been waiting so long to talk to you guys, and I'm just like, we're going to do this, and 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 this, and this. Several times throughout this past, I'm like. No kidding, for real? Mm. Wow, you know, and it's stuff like I'm like I gotta tell my wife about this. I gotta, you know, so I'm like because yeah. she doesn't listen to the show. She's she she's like no, I hear enough of you <laughs> right during my everyday. So I'm I'm like you, you gotta listen to this, your this, friends. This, this is the episode. <laughs> yeah, this is the episode to reacquaint our wives with our show. And That's right. We, and what know? we do when we sneak away and do these podcasts. That's right. And get in trouble later. Uh, yeah. We're not just uh, uh, you know. Uh, the, the, all right, right around town and doing exactly. all that stuff. No, this right. is great. So, yeah. so it's I literally, it's like we're at this yeah. place where I, it, you have to come back yeah. because I got to hear more about about your journey. And I think uh, absolutely the great thing is I have a feeling people who are listening to this are going to say the same thing. Yeah. So I want to hear on mic you saying you will be back with us, inshallah. Whatever. Absolutely. All right, there we go. You heard it here. All right, <laughs> yeah, absolutely. That's, that's the commitment. Thank you. Thank you. But in the, in, I guess in the meantime, I mean, if, if people want to find you online i mean uh, you know just maybe drop a few places where people can i'm probably most you. active on instagram which is okay. weird because i yeah. don't see very well like i'm legally blind and so on instagram is yeah. brother ali is blind is my name on there that's right so if something <laughs> if things are blurry or fuzzy yeah. or something like that you can't i doubt yeah. that i doubt that because you have the insight and then now uh, you're, you're on facebook a little or twitter yeah. brother ali both yeah. of those are just yeah. brother ali correct brother correct yeah. um and it's like where people find us uh, well, you can uh, uh, hit like on our Facebook page, Facebook.com. I'm doing the thing. I, I, I Two days ago when we recorded with Preacher Moss, yeah, I like, yeah. held off the info for my other show. <laughs> so I'm like, wait, hold on. What am I doing here? Okay. <laughs> Facebook.com <laughs> slash Diffuse Congruence. Mm -hmm. That's this show. Mm -hmm. It's a very good show. And uh, you can hit like on that page. You can also email us. It's the best show. It's the best show. But it, it, it is. It's, <laughs> it's just the best. Absolutely. <laughs> Do do the I'm doing the trumpet. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's what I'm, I'm it's pretending. Fantastic. <laughs> uh, emails at diffusecongruence at gmail dot com. You can also find us individually. My website is zakiscorner dot com. That's z a k i s corner. That's also my Twitter. That's also my Instagram. You can also find uh, Pervez yeah, at. Uh, I'm at uh, Pervez F Ahmed on Twitter and of course on Facebook. Um, and uh, and we have a Patreon. Oh, of course. Thank you. Yes, yes, patreon.com slash diffuse congruence for all the people who've uh, uh, become patrons. I can't thank you enough. And, and one of these days, we're going to rattle off the names of all the if, wonderful people if, who become a part If you want to hear part two of our brother Ali there you chat, go. there you go. Go to patreon.com. There we go. Exactly, exactly. Um, and, and with that, uh, that wraps up this episode of Diffuse Congruence. But please join us next time. We'll catch you soon.